Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Ornmore Library for Galway Public Libraries, Galway's Great Read 2020, entitled Eilish Dillon, Language, Landscape and Legacy. This evening we are celebrating Eilish Dillon, the storyteller, in our retrospective-themed seminar, Eilish Dillon, the historical writer. The Great Read initiative uh, promotes our library heritage, our history, our unique culture and fosters an appreciation for its diversity and richness. This year we are celebrating the life and work of Galway's most versatile writers, Eilish Dillon, through a programme of events and new commissions. We are delighted this evening to welcome as our guests Dr Jim Higgins, Heritage Officer for Galway City, Dr John Cunningham, Historian in UIG, Dr Anne-Marie Hearn, Independent Researcher. And our facilitator for this evening is Emily Cullen, Poet, Writer and Harper. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Joe. Fáilte a chóir de galéir chuig an ócáid speisial de seo, mar chuid de léif mór na gáilíve, agus mar chuid de camóra caib plín Eilish Dillon. Ladies and gentlemen, you're all very welcome to this special celebration as part of Galway's Great Read and the Eilish Dillon Centenary. So to return to Eilish Dillon in the Galway of her birth and of her childhood, I came upon this lovely insightful quotation which I'd like to share with you. It's taken from an article Dillon wrote and published in 1993, a year before her death, and it's entitled A Writer in Cork. She observes that the hinterland around Galway was the perfect setting for a potential writer intent on observing human nature in all its variations. The way was made easier by the fact that I spoke Irish as easily as English, so that no nuance was lost on me. Adults and children were always together and conversation was uninhibited. So I think that's a nice note to begin the session about Eilish Dillon, the historical writer, on. We have three wonderful guest speakers today, Dr. Jim Higgins, Dr. Anne-Marie Hearn, and Dr. John Cunningham. And our first speaker, Dr. Jim Higgins, will have a particular focus on the Galway of Eilish Dillon's time. So Dr. Jim Higgins is Heritage Officer with Galway City Council since 1998. An archaeologist by training, he has a long time interest in Galway's history and culture, as well as in the topography of the city and its hinterland. And today, as I mentioned, he's going to talk about the Galway of Eilish Dillon's time. Thanks very much for that lovely introduction, Emily. Thank you. I'm going to talk about Galway of the time of Eilish Dillon. It's a fascinating era, the 1920s in particular, the area around Dangan, the whole of the inner city, Barna. Eilish was lucky in a sense that she was able to enjoy the two peripheries of Galway, the area around Menlo, Dangan, all the wonderful nature and wildlife. She speaks about the kingfishers, and she speaks about the joy of being at Menlo and the enjoyment of being in and around Menlo Castle and so on. And on the other side of the city then, when they move to Barna, she has a great joy in her descriptions of Barna and the people there, the way of life, the softness of Barna, and I suppose the nature of the community there. Eilish was born in Galway, in very troubled times. She writes herself that, my senses were sharpened at a very early stage to understand the things that happened to us. And in a way, she recorded the revolutionary period in Galway at a time when nobody else was really publishing and recording it. And of that, people in the 30s, 40s and 50s were afraid to write about the revolutionary period, the period between say even 1913, 1911, down to 1923, 24. They were afraid to talk about the Civil War and so on. In a sense, I think the celebrations of the 50 years since the rising in, in 1966 may have generated a new interest. And even when you talk to the veterans of that period, one of the things that they all say, and I interviewed them about Eilish uh, many years ago, is that it was great to see that the whole period wasn't being forgotten, that it was being written about. Sean Turk, who was commandant of the IRA during the Troubles uh, in particular, he didn't like some of the things that she said about 
the Republican side during the Civil War. He wouldn't have given a statement to the army, for instance. He would have remained Republican all his life and he would have, his sense would have been that some of the characters that Ailish was writing about weren't either Republican enough or that what they said reflected maybe some doubts about the, the, the rightness of their cause. Now this is, in a way, it's ironic because Ailish's parents were very Republican. Uh, they were living in a Galway where they themselves were under threat of imprisonment. Um, they were imprisoned. Uh, they were smuggling arms. They were highly involved in that whole period. One of the things about Galway at the time brings across to some degree in our books in the same way that other writers don't is the poverty of the place. The fact that it was a city in ruins. There was an awful lot of poverty, yet there was an awful lot of overcrowding. I think the photographs that she asked Tom Kennedy to take and the ones that she chose in particular in Inside Ireland reflects a Galway which is more real and unimagined than the, I suppose the myth about Galway today as a, a great place of culture. In the 20s, in the 30s, it wasn't really a great place of culture. There was an awful lot of ruin. There was the urban myth that when the Germans flew over the city by accident, they thought they had already bombed the place. All of this was, was part of the urban myth. If you think about it in terms of the, the, the social history of the place, in the 1920s, in 1927, there was an outbreak of TB in the, in the Clada. And even from that stage on, the Urban District Council were almost intent on removing Clada, on getting rid of what they saw as an overcrowded, outdated, poverty-stricken place. It wasn't really until the 30s and right down until 1941 that eventually the Clada was being demolished. Uh, there was no housing that was supplied except the housing that was supplied by the local authority. No housing for the poor, that is. Chantilly wasn't really being built up until the 1940s when a private developer started to build some houses there. But it was really only when the corporation began to build houses in the 1950s, 1953, 54, 55, that people were being rehoused. Huge tranches of the inner city were derelict. There was a lot of poverty, and yet there were derelict buildings alongside buildings which are completely overcrowded. And Walter Mackin's Mungo's mansion reflects that reality. There was very little industry apart from the industries, uh, the chemicals, for instance, McDonough's, the coils, Long Walk, there was a chemical factory there. There would have been a constant stench of chemicals over the city. Even the old gas works would still have been in operation in Eilish's, Dillon's, youth and that would have, a stench from that would have pervaded the city as well. The fishing, the fishing was declining. It wasn't until again the 1950s when local authority housing had been built in Chantilly that you got the local authority housing people in Barview as well. An awful lot of people from the inner city were afraid of being sent out to Chantilly. That was way out in the country. The townies didn't like the idea of having to go out there, but that was where some of the houses were being supplied at the time. An awful lot of people who lived in Key Street, Cross Street, High Street, an awful lot of people from Middle Street and St Augustine Street. There was massive clum, uh, slum clearance there from around 1927, 1928 onwards. And a lot of those people went to live in the new housing estates in Bohemore, Merview, Chantilly. Now, at the same time, people were also coming in from the countryside around looking for work and were beginning to settle in Chantilly as well. So there was no city of culture at that time, not in the sense that we see it today. You could do a tour starting at Dangan and going right into the city and going out maybe the other side of the city and heading to Barna. And you could almost map, there's a cartography of Eilish's literary writing. And this literary writing reflects 
the revolutionary period and the history of the time. Her parents knew all the veterans. They lived in their houses, they hid each other, they communicated with each other. In the 1930s, the commandant of the IRA, one of the commandants in the city, Sean Turk, went to America. He went to Rochester. And over there, he met an awful lot of veterans. And these were ve veterans who were determined that the revolutionary period, the war that they took part in, wouldn't be forgotten. And they set up a Father Michael Griffin Republican Memorial Committee in Rochester. Now, the name of that changed over the years. And the Republican was in the literature at one time, out at another time. Sean Tolkien got to Galway with the promise of a lot of funding to erect a monument. And that monument was to be erected first of all in Air Square, and later on then down near the boys' school on Bridge Street. The monument hasn't yet been erected. In the 1940s, the committee was still gathering funds. Funds were still being made available from America. Eventually, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, Thomas Dillon and Geraldine Plunkett Dillon became members of the committee and more or less took over the running of it, along with John Hostie, who was a printer who had been involved in the War of Independence. He had worked in, in O'Gorman's. When you read the literature of the committee, the committee changed its name then and it became the Galway County Volunteer Memorial Committee. You can see the names of Dylan's ghosts in a sense, because all of these people on the committee, they would have been known very well. They would have been active with her mother and her father. And these people were determined that the history wouldn't be forgotten. And I think in a way, Ailish has provided a monument, not a physical monument, but she has provided a literary monument to the men and women who took part in the revolution at the time. If we do a sort of a virtual tour, or if we do a literary cartography of the city, and if we start at Dangan, uh, Ailish's descriptions of the kingfishers in the river, her descriptions of, uh, of Venlo Castle are all extremely poignant. She would have been living out that area of Dangan, Newcastle, a lot of the people, members of staff of of the uh, university would have been living out there. Professor Shea later lived in the house that uh, the Plunkett Dillons lived in, for instance. Going in from the city in towards the university, that would have been originally Queen's College at the time of the Troubles, and then later the Nash University of Ireland. So even the names and the history are reflected in, the, in, the, in those changes. Professor Dillon himself would have been part of the chemistry department. The students of the chemistry department would have been involved in all sorts of protests against conscription in particular. There was a very strong group of Sinn Féin members and volunteers in the university at the time. They would have made chemicals in the chemistry department and they would have used them to make chemicals to make stink bombs and so on to disrupt recruiting meetings. Later, uh, the chemistry department became a hiding place for Professor Dillon and, and others involved in the, uh, in the War of Independence. If we move then to the Salmon Weir Bridge, there's a very evocative uh, description of the Salmon Weir Bridge. And it almost reflects a postcard of the time. There was a lovely postcard produced by Simmons photographers. And it shows the, the water literally thick with salmon. You know, they want to make eels of themselves to make space for each other. And she describes that. If we imagine Ailish coming back to Galway now and going on this tour, she would have looked perhaps with great sadness at the jail. Uh, her mother was imprisoned in the jail. One of the first memories that uh, Ailish had was of her mother's arrest and her imprisonment. Her mother wanted to bring her into the jail with her so that she would be minded. Eventually she was left with one of the maids. And she, I don't know, perhaps Riley said in one of her uh, descriptions, uh, Ailish did, that uh, she was deprived of the opportunity of serving a sentence or going to jail for Ireland because she wasn't uh, brought into the jail.
if we go past the jail and if we look at the Town Hall Theatre, the Town Hall, wonderful building now, great place of culture and so on, but a bit decrepit at the time, even though a huge number of events were held there. One of the major events was the 1913 Oireachtas. And this, in a sense, gave emphasis and gave an impetus to the revolution in Galway. The Oireachtas met for the first time outside Dublin in 1913. Eilish's grandparents are among the people who are featured in the, that famous photograph taken of the Oireachtas outside the steps uh, of the Town Hall Theatre. She might have thought as well, apart from thinking of her, her mother being in Galway jail and thinking of her grandparents featuring in the photograph, her thoughts might have turned if she was young enough in 1921 to remember her mother's arrest. She might have been, she might have been young enough to, I mean, that was a traumatic event. But at around the same time, there was a temporary internment camp at the Town Hall Theatre where prisoners, the overflow of Republican prisoners from Galway jail were being held. And it might have come into her mind influenza and the effects of influenza. Two of the prisoners died of influenza. And her own father, of course, when he was in Gloucester jail, had influenza. And uh, that's mentioned a couple of times in her books, the, the, the fear of that sort of uh, illness. If we go up Eglinton Street, we see more of the ghosts as well, are we? Eglinton Street, she describes in her book the RIC station at Eglinton Street, and she had a, has a description of the Igo gang. They were named after Eugene Igo. He, had been, he was an RIC man, he was an RIC officer, he was uh, in Killeen, uh, RIC barracks. For a short time he was stationed in Eglinton Street, and then he was sent to Dublin. One of the people who was uh, sent to Dublin to try and identify Igo because Igo was being very effective against the Republican movement in Dublin uh, was Sweeney Newell and Michael Collins sent Sweeney Newell to Dublin in order to flush out Igo. There are descriptions of Igo um, in the military archives for instance that describe him as being very brash and very I suppose, cowboyish. And I think probably in blood, blood relations, there is a description of Igo where she describes, or, sorry, it's in The Bitter Glass, uh, where, where there is a description of a black and tan. Now, he wasn't a black and tan, he was an RSC man, with two guns in his pockets and ready to blaze at any moment. And that might, in fact, be a description of uh, Eugene Igo. It might also describe Edward Crumb. Edward Crumb was an auxiliary driver. There was an incident at the station during which he took out his guns and he shot in the air. There was a number of volunteers present. They jumped on his back and among the people that were there were Sean Mulvoy and Sean Mulvoy was shot. So those are the memories that, that might have come into her mind going up along that area. Air Square, she'd have, uh, in Air Square there would have been plenty of associations for Eilish as well if she was to visit Air Square because uh, one of the first, the statue of Lee Mellows of course wasn't erected until 1957. But her mother uh, would have been one of the people who was supplied with weaponry and dynamite and was asked by Lee Mellows to bring them to Dublin. She might have looked over, she might glance at the, at the statue of a fellow student of hers or another presentation student, uh, Porrick O'Connor, sitting in the square since the late 1930s. Uh, she might, for instance, um, look up Prospect Hill the people who would have been in Common Amman with her mother would have included Peg Broderick. Peg Broderick's brother would have been shot in the station. He pretended to be worse than he was. He pretended to be dead and survived. The other people that might have come to mind in the square would have been uh, Evelyn de Borca, uh, who was also a member of Common Amman with Geraldine. Eilish 
also looked at the topography of the town. She described the old warehouses and she gave the impression that those were all at the quay. Some of them were, some of them would have, would have been in Merchant's Road. And the dereliction there, she referred to the Spanish Arch. And around that time, the Spanish Arch would have been lived in by Claire Sheridan, for instance. Claire Sheridan was one of the people who had a particular interest in the books of Eilish Schillen. She collected them, she had a lot of them. And I remember interviewing her biographer, Anita Leslie, and she said that what Eilish's writing did was give uh, her, uh, Anita Leslie, a sense of another side of Ireland that she hadn't really any great experience of. Eilish talked about the Spanish Arch, the Clada, the fishermen with their uh, blue jumpers, uh, the, the boats and so on. She might have taken a bus, for instance, out towards Salt Hill. If she was to take a bus, she'd encounter more ghosts. Uh, the ghost of William Joyce, for instance, at Sea Road and Montpellier Terrace. He was a student at, at the Jesuit school. She describing William Joyce or saying, it's a wonder that they're more or less, it's a wonder that his parents aren't taking him in hand. He's getting up on the backs of the auxiliaries and he is, is wandering around town with them. And then somebody else says, well, you know, it's probably no wonder sure isn't his father a hangman? Wasn't that what he was at in New York before he came to Galway? And of course, I think she was being ironic there because she would have known very well that the son, William Joyce, came to no good and ended up being hung himself. So these, this is the topography of Galway uh, in a literary sense, but also in a historical sense. She, through her parents, didn't need the military archives. She wouldn't have been able to consult them at the time, but she had all that information and she was able to almost erect a monument in a literary sense for the whole period of the revolution in Galway, right from 1913, right up to 1922 and the Civil War. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jim, for that wonderful talk. Our second speaker today is Dr. John Cunningham. Uh, John is a lecturer in history at NUI Galway and a former editor of SEHER, Journal of Irish Labour History. He has published extensively on Irish local history and on labour history, and he is co-editor with Dr. Kieran McDonough of the forthcoming book, Hardyman and Beyond, Galway Arts and Culture, 1820 to 2020. John, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, Emily, for those. Eilish Dillon's parents were married on Easter Sunday, 1916, and from their honeymoon hotel, the Imperial on Sackville or O'Connell Street, they watched Dublin go up in flames on the following day. Both were connected in many different ways with the insurrection in which Mrs. Dillon's brother, Joseph Plunkett, was one of the leaders. Our subject, consequently, was part of one of the founding families of the Irish state, her uh, father and mother imprisoned or on the run during her early childhood. Born a year before the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty and dying in 1994, the year generally held to have marked the beginning of the Celtic Tiger era, Eilish Dillon's life spanned was essentially the, a short uh, 20th century if we're to apply Eric Hobsbawm's uh, periodization. Uh, though she's remembered mainly for the considerable body of her creative work in Irish and English, her substantial non-fiction uh, work, uh, Inside Ireland, which was published towards the end of her life, is it of uh, considerable uh, interest. Uh, published in London in 1982 by Hodder and Stoughton with uh, 79 black and white photographs by Tom Kennedy, the book was evidently aimed at an international um, as well as an Irish audience. In its form, in the way it combines descriptions of places and encounters with history and reflections, inside Ireland, or most of it, um, resembles a travel narrative. But the journey she embarks on uh, takes us through her life 
and the places uh, with which she had a strong association. Her native Galway looms large, and this has been uh, well covered by Jim, as does Dublin, uh, where she spent time as a teenager uh, with her grandparents. So does Sligo, uh, where she attended a boarding school, and Cork, where she went to live after her marriage, and indeed where she embarked on her writing life. Donegal and Derry are featured, perhaps more because one could hardly produce a, a book under uh, that title without a chapter uh, covering Ulster and indeed addressing the troubles of the previous decade or so. I've described the family as a founding family of the Free State and she makes it clear uh, in the uh, early chapters that they were no Johnny-come-latelys as it were. Both Dillons and Plunkett's, she points out, were of Norman origin and in her account of Irish history she proceeds to connect her own stock with such uh, distinguished bearers of the names as uh, St. Oliver Plunkett and uh, John Dillon, the last leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party uh, before it was superseded by Sinn Féin in 1918. She was born to public service, as she infers, and in her treatment of her father, she shows he certainly carried a sense of patriotic duty into all aspects of his life. Having learned Irish uh, while in prison, uh, it was the only language that Tom Dillon used in communicating uh, with his children. As professor of chemistry at University College Galway, he sought to use his skills uh, to develop industry and to create employment opportunities in Ireland. There's plenty of other evidence uh, which uh, confirms this, including uh, Thomas Dillon's own testimony uh, to the Gaeltacht Commission of the mid-1920s. And clearly, Eilish Dillon greatly admired her father. But she also indicates that he wasn't a very practical man uh, with regard to matters like the family finances. Uh, but if she admired her father, much more attention is um, uh, paid in Inside Ireland uh, to the Plunkets. Uh, giving the impression that she identified uh, more strongly uh, with them. Of course, this may simply have been have because she had access uh, to more detail about them, possibly from her mother's memoirs, uh, which uh, would be published in uh, uh, 2006, All in the Blood. The history in uh, Inside Ireland is fairly conventionally nationalist, Catholic nationalist, if um, a liberal uh, uh, Catholicism uh, we're talking about. And uh, this is leavened, as I said, with the engagement uh, with her family's story. Otherwise, it wouldn't be unfair to say that the perspective in the book is quite a middle-class one, although there's a strong sense of noblesse oblige, as it were, um, which uh, following on from her father, uh, but also by her understanding of the role, of the public roles of generations of Plunkett. And we know that Eilish Dillon acted upon this sense of public duty in her own life as an active member of the Irish Writers Union, uh, as a supporter of the Irish uh, Writers uh, Centre, as well as being a member of the Arts Council and other bodies. For the social historian of the uh, 21st century, uh, looking back from the 21st century, as it were, the most interesting parts of the book uh, are those where she recounts her personal experience of engagement with people and with institutions, and where she provides insights into the predicaments and compensations associated with being a writer in Ireland. In both regards, I'll uh, do my best to steer clear of Galway, which has been uh, discussed by others. Her experience as a boarder from the age of 11 in the Ursuline Convent School in Sligo has a lot that is interesting about uh, female middle-class education in 1930s Ireland. Uh, one feels it's not a typical uh, convent school of uh, the era. Uh, for one thing, the Ursulines were an enclosed order. Uh, for another, uh, the atmosphere was strongly Francophile. Uh, with teachers evidently committed to educating their charges to the highest academic standard without undue attention uh, to their future lives as um, wives and mothers. If the incidents she describes where uh, student arguments prevailed over uh, those of the nuns, 
Uh, it was a more than usually uh, liberal uh, boarding school of its era. One detail is entered uh, without comment though, which gives us an insight into class uh, distinction in the institution, uh, where she distinguishes between the choir nuns, and I'm quoting here, the choir nuns who were educated and ran the school, and the lay sisters who had little or no education and did the housework and cooking and answered the front door. A further phase of her life commenced in 1940, when at the age of just 20, Eilish Dillon married uh, Cormac O'Collionon, uh, a lecturer in Irish at University College Cork. O'Collionon had come from uh, more modest uh, circumstances uh, than she did, uh, but at 37, he was old enough to be a veteran of the Cork No. 1 Brigade of the IRA in the War of Independence, and also of the anti-treaty side in the Civil War. If she was very ro uh, young for the role she was taking up, her background had to some uh, extent prepared her to be an academic spouse, an academic wife, uh, but evidently UCC was very different uh, to UCG. Entering the Cork upper middle class, she found a lingering unionism among both Catholics and uh, Protestants as well as a dread that their children might somehow uh, be exposed to the Clark accent. Boys and girls uh, were consequently shipped off to English public schools and upper crust uh, convents, with some of the Protestants choosing uh, Port Ora in, uh, in Esquillen uh, for their sons. The social life of uh, the university families, uh, she found, and I'm quoting here, had been noticeably affected by the standards of the business people. She described the ritual surrounding an invitation to tea. Calling cards were used, a small one for a lady and a larger one, as well as a small one for her husband, all three delivered by the lady, who might come in and sit for 10 minutes if she happened to find you at home. Sometime after this call, an invitation to tea arrived. A cork tea party in those days followed an exact ritual. The invitation was formally written and arrived by post. It was for four o'clock and one timed one's arrivals for 10 minutes past four to the minute. Overcoats might be removed, but all efforts to dislodge the hat was to be resisted. Gloves were to be retained for five minutes and then deposited in the purse. At half past five, the children appeared. They stayed until six, at which time the party broke up. So that's a Cork tea party in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, there's much more uh, detail um, about elite social life drawn from her personal experience uh, in Inside Ireland, yachting, fox hunting, point to point uh, races, which we can't go into here. But for this merry-go-round uh, to run uh, smoothly, uh, a good maid was essential. And Dylan acknowledged that she had one such herself. Dressed in black with a white lace cap and a frilly apron, the maid in these houses was invariably from West Cork, uh, where Dylan says there was a tradition of domestic service. Though during her time in Cork, she says, uh, they were beginning uh, to disappear into English factories. Without such support, one hypothesizes that it would have been difficult for Eilish Dillon uh, to have uh, commenced her writing career while raising three children and operating a student hostel. She has something uh, to say also about social activities of the Cork working class, describing some of the rituals surrounding rabbit hunting with ferrets, beagling in the countryside around Blarney, and bowling, or road bowling as well, of hurling, she writes. When the match is about to begin, a stranger might be astonished to see an elderly cleric being escorted onto the field and going through a process rather like inspecting a guard of honor. Then he is handed the ball, which he throws in among the players, afterwards quietly scurrying off the field to a place of safety on the sidelines. In respect of some small detail, however, Inside Ireland seems to be out of date in 1982, perhaps because for family reasons, the author had spent much of the previous uh, 20 years in Italy and the United States. 
Her account of seasonal migration from Donegal and of practices with regard to matchmaking and dowries in rural Cork seem to belong uh, to the 1950s or even the 1930s. Uh, so I'll finish by looking briefly at her treatment of writing, writers and writing. Um, in discussing uh, Parik O'Connor, uh, she gives an insight into how she perceived the, pers the position of the writer in uh, society. Quote again, O'Connor slipped easily into the writer's role, which still obtains in Ireland of a person outside society, the free impartial observer, the intellectual, who may or not have occult powers, but who is to be treated with caution in any case. She goes on, O'Connor would have approved of the special position accorded to all artists in Ireland where their earnings are untaxed as a matter of respect. Um, of the impact of, the, of another writer, uh, specifically of his satire, she writes of uh, Flann O'Brien, arguably with a considerable degree of exaggeration. She starts, it is no exaggeration uh, to say that he is responsible for a valuable quality of plainness and practical simplicity in our rising governing class. Anyone planning to display external symbols of prosperity or power is liable to hear an echo of Flann O'Brien's mocking, mocking voice uh, cutting him down uh, to size. It doesn't seem to have worked in the case of Charlie Hawhey, who was, uh, who was in power at around the time the book appeared. Now, one of the issues of great concern to Irish writers up until the 1960s was censorship. And she uses a recollection of the confiscation by an Ursuline nun of a book of poetry inscribed by her late uncle Joseph Mary Plunkett to introduce the subject of uh, literary censorship more generally, the irrationality of the uh, censors and so on. Uh, the effects of which she suggested were muted somewhat by the establishment of an appeals board in 1946. She shows, shows that the consequence for individual writers went beyond the banning of their books and she gives examples of people losing jobs and being demoted in their day jobs, as it were, in the case of, of writers who fell foul of the censors. And the censoriousness uh, extended throughout the society, uh, as uh, suggested in an anecdote she told of an encounter uh, in uh, middle-class Cork. The first time that I spoke warmly and appreciatively of Sean O'Fallon and Frank O'Connor, I was met with a cold stare, then an equally cold question as to whether I was a liberal. This meant a person of loose ethical standards, and it soon became clear that these two eminent sons of Cork were considered something of a disgrace. They had demystified the clergy and had shown up the falsity of some of their fellow citizens' attitudes, their tolerance of the sins of their friends, their cruelty in rumour and gossip, their sharpness in business, their ignorance of the outside world, their self-satisfaction with their own way of life, and their unconscious humour in all kinds of easily recognisable situations. It was not to be tolerated. Elsewhere in the book, though, she reflected um, of uh, censorship that, and I quote, it was infinitely better, however, than hanging dissidents from the lamppost. And that might be the place uh, to conclude, insofar as it sums up um, a message of inside Ireland. Uh, the Ireland we have made, she's saying, uh, isn't perfect or ideal. But we didn't do a terribly bad job. Thanks very much for that, John. And our final and third speaker today is Dr. Anne-Marie Heron. Anne-Marie is a former primary school principal with an abiding interest in literature and in publications for children in particular. She has studied extensively in this area with a master's in children's literature in 2007 and in 2011 with the completion of her PhD thesis entitled The Tyranny of the Past, Revolution, Retrospection and Remembrance in the Work of Irish Writer Eilish Dillon. And indeed, I believe she is the only person to have completed a PhD on all of Eilish Dillon's corpus of writing. So she is indeed an expert and we're delighted to have her here. Since then, Anne-Marie has worked as an independent researcher with a focus on the arts, 
uh, in education within various institutions and cultural bodies. And her paper is entitled A Moment's Memory, A Reflection on Dylan as a Historical Novelist. Anne-Marie. Thank you very much, Emily. Good evening, everybody. In an Irish Times obituary at the time of her death in 1994, writer and academic Declan Kybird described Eilish Dillon as a woman of letters of a kind not seen in Ireland since the days of Lady Augusta Gregory. He cited Cool Park 1929, the W.B. Yeats poem, in praise of Lady Gregory as an epitaph equally fitting for Dillon. In that poem, there is an exhortation to the traveller, scholar and poet to remember Lady Gregory and to dedicate a moment's memory to that laurelled head. Perhaps now, here, not too far from Cool Park, 100 years after her birth, it is apt that we show our appreciation for the equally great contribution to literature made by Elise Dillon and provide that moment of memory she also so richly deserves. Dillon is remembered for her many achievements, but first and foremost, for us as readers, she was a woman who valued the concept of story and storytelling. More importantly, she understood the power of the story and its enduring influence on children, adults, and more generally on the nation itself. From her early childhood, she'd been steeped in stories, first listening to anecdotes of her ancestors' glorious past, since on both sides, the Dillons and the Plunkets had been involved in many of the significant events in Ireland's history. Born just four years after the execution of her uncle, Joseph Plunkett, she herself was part of that revolutionary story, as both John and Jim have referred to earlier. She wrote, I was born into a world of ghosts. We lived in a state of permanent terror. Violence was all around us. The black and tans were riding high and were out of control. As previously mentioned, she experienced the trauma of having witnessed attacks on her home by the black and tans and her mother being dragged off to Galway prison. This was during a period when her father was on the run from the Crown forces during the War of Independence. The effects of these episodes stayed with her made a great impact on her personally and were fundamental to her formation as a writer. She recalled, I grew up in the midst of unending discussions and arguments about what happened when and what incident led to what other one, and also remarked that at seven years of age, she couldn't conceal that her head was full of stories. Stories were part of her DNA and her heritage. She later reflected, throughout my childhood, reminiscences and anecdotes built up in my mind, some picture of how it was to be present during that extraordinary period in Ireland. Having learned to read at a very early age, her world of story expanded greatly, and she didn't discriminate between the numerous ways in which this world could be explored. In time, her interests ranged through Greek and Roman mythology, Irish poetry, laments and ballads, fireside tales told in Barna, plays seen in the Thaiviarch and Galway, the folklore of Porrick Cullum, and later in life, stories in Italian, and many novels from the great 19th century and Russian writers, as well as other works in translation. And so it was no wonder that she wished to share this gift of story by becoming a writer, firstly with books in the Irish language for young children, adventure stories for older ones, and three very engaging crime novels for adults. But there was one story that she yearned to tell, the story that would make a difference if told properly, one that would involve huge commitment and extensive research on her part. That was the story of her country, its people, its language, its landscape, and of course the heartbreaking narrative of its struggle for freedom. Dylan was an admirer and indeed translator of the work of the Italian writer Ignazio Salone, because as she pointed out, he showed a deep understanding of the spiritual needs of poor country people. In an essay she wrote, Dylan quoted his remark that every writer has only one story he wants to write, and his life's work will contain variations on this theme in spite of himself. Indeed, Salone inscribed this message to her in a copy of one of his plays. It's a new story, but always the same story. This is not at all to denigrate repetition on the part of writers, but to underline their preoccupation with something they care about so deeply and their duty to narrate that one story which is part of their identity. Over the course of her career, Dylan told her particular story in a series of six historical novels set against a number of episodes in which history and family memory combine. In these, she aimed to expose the brutality of anti-colonial insurrection, while at the same time promoting the potential for a newly independent Ireland. In adopting the genre, Dylan was following a line of female writers, including Mariah Edgeworth, Lady Morgan, Emily Lawless and Somerville and Ross, 
who had depicted Ireland from their own cultural perspectives. Male Catholic writers like Gerald Griffin, Michael Bannon and William Carleton had also paved the way with their portrayals of the Irish peasantry. Dillon, with her huge familial involvement in Irish military and social history, could present with confidence the facts of insurgence and revolution. In addition, with her knowledge of the natives of Galway, along with her familiarity with the ascendancy classes, she could bring her own unique version of historical fiction, merging a strong nationalist narrative with elements of big house novels. But what motivated Dillon to embark on this all-encompassing mission to depict historical events? As a member of a family of high achievers, she wanted to make her mark as a writer, but also wished to contribute to the family legacy and the high ideals of her forebears. She had a heightened sense and awareness of the status of her ancestors, their success and spirit of patriotism, and an inherited sense of duty and obligation therefore propelled her to add something uniquely her own to the historical narrative and to do something worthy and admirable in her own right. Dylan felt that it was the business of serious writers to be interpreters of their own people and their history. While she had done this to some extent in her books for children, in those she had focused mainly on the need to inspire and encourage her readers, instilling the confidence needed in a young independent state and promoting the need for forgiveness between old enemies. With historical fiction, she could broaden these messages in an adult context, describe a sense of nationalist fervour with greater honesty, celebrate patriotism, commemorate those who had sacrificed themselves, and most of all, maintain a memory of the past and allow it to continue into the future. This was a philosophy derived from the great 18th century orator, Edmund Burke, who Dylan admired greatly. Burke espoused the idea of the eternal society, identifying the link between the past, the present, the future, and as he put it, a partnership, not only of those who are living, but those who are dead and those who are yet to be born. Like Burke, Dylan believed that people will not look forward to posterity if they never look backwards to their ancestors and that a nation should be guided by its traditions. It was only by confronting the past that Ireland could prosper. By telling the full story, difficult events could be laid to rest, not to be forgotten, but to enable forgiveness. Dylan, recognising the therapeutic value of literature, believed that it had the power to cure the ills of war and suffering. The story could be a sort of healing balm, a cure for the embedded hatred that still prevailed, and yet could provide intellectual reassurance by revisiting, interrogating and then remembering the past. One of her characters in Across the Bitter Sea paraphrases the mythological Aeneas, who after one of his great military achievements, turned to his warriors and urged them to recall their great deeds with the words, we had a hard time, a hard passage, but it will be a pleasure to us in after days to remember these things. This is often translated as, a joy it will be one day perhaps to remember even this. Story, as Dylan saw it, provided a way of dealing with unfinished business and narrating history within story meant that national events of the past could enter the collective consciousness and exert influence on present day reality. Historical fiction allowed her to do this. While powerful in its capacity to ignite old animosities, the genre could also provide opportunities for reflection. It would also pierce the silence of post-colonial amnesia, often adopted to escape shameful episodes of history. Dylan, it seems, had found the perfect genre through which not only to tell the story of the Plunkets and Dylans, which is central to her work, but also to present her own hopes and opinions. She did this in six novels that covered a wide time span. The Bitter Glass is set against the background of the Irish Civil War. Across the Bitter Sea deals with post-famine Ireland in 1851 up to the events of 1916. Blood Relations is an account of the after effects of the 1916 Rising. Wild Geese is the story of Ireland's nobility's flight to France in 1691. While Citizen Burke tells us about the life of a conflicted Irish priest in post-revolutionary France and the Ireland of 1798. These five works follow a circular chronology since she began in 1958 with the Civil War and then moved sequentially several centuries back in time to eventually return in 1987, almost 30 years later, in The Interloper, her last historical novel, to events of 1922 and 23, finally rounding up her narrative. These five works follow a circular chronology since she began in 1958 with the Civil War and then moved sequentially several centuries back in time to eventually return in 1987 almost 30 years later, in The Interloper, her last historical novel, 
to events of 1922 and 23, finally rounding up her narrative. Dylan began very bravely, or perhaps naively, by setting the bitter glass against the background of the Irish Civil War. She had erroneously thought in the late 1950s that the country was ready to confront its past as Ireland emerged from economic, social and cultural stagnation and was entering a new era of growth and prosperity. She is to be admired for taking on this task and she did so with a view to educating the nation lest the events would be forgotten. Her summary early on in the book seeks to set the record straight from both sides and makes for concise reading. I'll just read a little bit. Talking about both sides. On neither side did the leaders care a fig for their lives. All of them had come to terms with death six years before. One side was disillusioned and bitter, but willing to build up a new state on the ruins of the old one. On the other side were the diehards, who preferred death to dishonour, and who were utterly incapable of taking an oath of allegiance to the English king. So throughout Ireland, the civil war blazed up, Republicans on one side, Free Staters on the other, and poor Mother Era wringing her hands between the two of them. A very concise history lesson indeed. So while The Bitter Glass received very positive reviews in London and New York, Dylan soon discovered that Ireland was not yet ready to be reminded of its shameful past and she received harsh criticism for tackling this contentious topic. She interpreted this negativity as a sign that she had blasphemed in writing a novel about that period at all. This criticism took a huge toll on her and it was to be 15 years before she felt confident enough to return to the historical genre although she may have been encouraged by the success of other contemporary writers, for example, Thomas Kilroy, James Plunkett and J.G. Farrell, who were tackling similar themes. Across the Bitter Sea, published in 1973, is a panoramic and epic novel spanning events from post-famine Ireland of 1851 and leading to the events of 1916. It was widely popular, gained bestseller status at home and abroad, and was deemed to be Dylan's most significant work. The author admitted to using all the experiences of her lifetime, even the most painful ones, while also rigorously researching historical sources for what she called the factual set pieces. The novel was plotted carefully in order to bring history to life and to track the hardening of nationalism until militant rebellion became inevitable. Dylan was always aware of creating in her work a credible atmosphere for the reader. She relied heavily on her mother's and grandparents' memories of real events and on the experiences of her husband Cormac. She trawled through family archives and newspapers of the time, her in-depth research providing authenticity to the work. In this and all her novels, Dylan followed the pattern and themes that are common to historical fiction, among them conflict, societal extremes, customs and traditions, and the portrayal of heroes who sacrifice themselves. Dylan consistently wrote about Ireland's colonial past and the struggle for freedom, and dealt realistically with continuous conflict. She was able to portray the extremes within society by contrasting the lives of the wealthy Anglo-Irish landlord class with the lives of the rural people she'd been familiar with from childhood. And because of her own cultural background, aligned with her knowledge of the West of Ireland, she could compare the customs, beliefs, language and traditions of both classes. And of course, heroes were no strangers within her family or as family friends, and she could portray them with the conviction of an insider. And as in most historical novels, as author, she presents her own point of view with regard to the events of the story. Dylan also inserted her own unique style into the novels with beautiful and vivid descriptions of the Western landscape, its topography, the sights and sounds of days gone by, the nuances and rhythms of the language of the people, their ballads and poetry, their nobility in the face of adversity, the plight of women, and even the often unsung landlords who behaved with kindness. But most importantly, Dylan stamped her own particular hallmark on these books, articulating her inherited deeply held opinions on the forgiveness and reconciliation essential to the progress of an emerging nation. She had learned from her parents that hatred of the enemy was dishonourable and should be replaced by mutual understanding and conciliation in order for the country to progress. She recalled, hatred had no part in the reminiscences of my parents. Failures were attributed to weakness of character or bad judgment or lack of understanding. The English were not spoken of with hatred, not even the black and tans, though their governments and their actions were condemned. This message is at the heart of her writing and personified in the fictional character of Alice in Across the Bitter Sea, who is the personification of justice, charity, truth and human sympathy, even towards those involved in heinous acts. Alice display, displays all the traits to which, as a nation, we should aspire.
This is the recurring spirit in all of Dylan's work, but it is in her last novel, The Interloper, that it is most overtly stated. With this book, published in 1987, she returns at last to the events of 1922 and 23, and goes a step further in penetrating the silence about the Civil War. It begins, I've got to tell this story to someone. This is the voice of the eponymous interloper, but also Dylan voicing her own need to finish telling her one essential story. It is her final effort to confront, clarify and explain the conflict that had so closely affected not only her own family, but also thousands of other Irish families and communities. The interloper comes home to settle a score, to take his revenge on his former comrade, now enemy. The two old men, each bitter and intransigent, recall, remind, stir up memories and finally admit to truths about the past. Differences and misunderstood actions are bared. The interloper who came to murder his own old rival realises the futility of the act and decides not to exact his revenge. In the final scene, he decides to let sleeping dogs lie, closes the door and drives away with one backward glance towards the cottage. And so ends that chapter of mutual hatred. It also marked the end of Dylan telling her one essential story, but she had finally put her ghosts and those of the nation to rest. And Dylan would be pleased to know that today she herself is also remembered. Declan Kybert, in that obituary I referred to earlier, believed that she would be remembered for the versatility of her literary output, the lucid grace of her prose, the warmth and range of her friendships, the firmness of spirit and the shrewdness of purpose with which she launched herself into many worthy projects. Kybert recognised her as an essayist, novelist, autobiographer, activist, dramatist, translator, scholar and mother figure to two generations of writers and artists. For us, her readers, we can appreciate all that, but perhaps even more relevantly, we value her legacy to us as a storyteller of Ireland's history and of her own particular story, a story well told. Boy. 
highlighted uh, the sense of Eilish Dillon's writing as a literary monument, which is a wonderful way of thinking about her legacy and her achievement. Um, would you care to tease that out a little bit more for us? Um, the sense that is she, is she trying to counter culture and, uh, cultural amnesia? Um, did she feel an urgent need to, you know, to document this period, this revolutionary period at the time? Um, I was fascinated to, to think about her work, to hear that concept, that idea of her, her writing as a literary monument. Do you remember the, uh, yeah. the, the, uh, the, the, her literary uh, inheritance as a monument? Yeah, and that she kind of felt, I suppose, a bit of a responsibility maybe to, to write down, to, as you're saying, that she captured that history and, in well, her work. And she did in a very literary sense what other members of her family did in the historical sense, because, you know, it's one of the few families that they have a huge history about, in the sense you have uh, All in the Blood, and then you have Maman, you know, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of strict history written, but she went the literary route. And, you know, her parents were involved in uh, trying to erect a monument for many years uh, since then. Uh, and that had, that had ultimately failed. It was, you know, in 2016, the idea was revived, for instance, and it might happen yet. But for years and years and years, this, this was going on since the 1930s, the idea of erecting a monument in Galway to the people who were involved in uh, 1916 to 23. It wasn't for lack of support, in fact, because, you know, you had everybody from the Bishop of Galway to Lord Killannon to a lot of the veterans. You had Matt Hackett, for instance, one of the veterans. You had Sean Tuck. Sean Tuck brought the initial money over from America when he went there in the 19, early 1930s. Uh, and the idea of the monument was uh, was brought about the for the Griffin uh, Republican Memorial Committee. Uh, that committee then existed for many years, and it was revived really by the Hosties and by the Plunkett Dillons. And they were leading members of the committee, and they wanted to build that monument. So what Eilish has left is, even though the monument, the stone monument, was never built. She has left a literary heritage that records the, the, the whole period. And even veterans who didn't really agree with her interpretation of the Civil War in particular, uh, they were always, they, they often pointed out to me that it was great to see her books discussing the whole topic because they felt that they had been forgotten about. There was a reluctance, certainly in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, for people to write about the history of the period. It wasn't considered history yet. So th there, was, th th there was a revival of interest in 1966, really, because of the, uh, of the, of the celebrations and so on. And an awful lot of the veterans would have marched in Galway. And you had a lot of events around it. Siobhan McKenna would have read a proclamation from the from the uh, Lee Mellow statue, which was, which was only there since uh, actually 1957. Um, the barracks in Renmore had only been renamed after Mellows in, 19, in 1952. The monument that was never erected, that was supposed to be on a site beside the, uh, the boys' school on the river, on the river canal, the canal there uh, beside the river. And that area, that walk, was to be renamed after Father Michael Griffin. So all of these things, in theory, people wanted them to happen. They were good to, uh, they were delighted really to see uh, themselves being written about, written about, even if it was in a literary sense, even if some of the figures were uh, imaginative. Uh, but it was like, it was as if, well, at least a topic is now being discussed. Yes. It wasn't until a few years later that uh, people like Colin Maguire were writing about the, the Civil War in Connacht, for instance, you know. But so I suppose it's essentially a literary edifice that she has bequeathed to us. It is uh, a literary documenting evidence. Documenting a very it's, important time. You know, it's, it, it's, it's a monument in words, a monument in, in, in literary form. So. Yes, and I thought it was very interesting that you mentioned that milestone of 1966 when there was a newfound confidence about 
articulating this history and uh, and a kind of a sense of you know validation of that we, we can speak about our history um, and it's interesting of course that 1958 was the year that the bitter glass was published before yeah. that confidence uh, rose if you like and um, Anne-Marie if I could just come to you uh, the bitter glass a beautiful book you know um, uh, but you know um, hailed overseas by the international critics but in Ireland uh, it, it, it got some very unfavourable reviews and uh, unkind reviews <laughs> and uh, and of course they didn't mention the Civil War in the reviews which was interesting. No I think um, closer to home obviously it was more contentious than it would have been abroad um, and I think she as I mentioned earlier I think she underestimated um, how unready the country was really to um, tackle that the silence that was around the Civil War so she was uh, as I said earlier both brave and a little naive in terms of um, what she expected as uh, the reviews she would get. And there was one particular one that uh, was kind of fairly vicious. It said, uh, it's a, a badass that eats its own straddle mat. I think meaning that uh, she shouldn't have tackled the topic at all. She was criticized for her depiction of a local doctor who was essentially a drug addict. And uh, as you can imagine, that sort of thing didn't go down well. So she was, she was very hurt by the criticism and um, it stopped her from tackling subjects like that for a very long time. And she says that, you know, she, she, I suppose, retreated in a sense into writing children's books for a period. And then in the 1970s, she said she lost that fear again and she started upon Across the Bitter Sea. Yes, it had become more fashionable to write historical fiction in the 70s. And there were writers like Leon Uris um, writing blockbusters at the time. Although Dylan was um, critical of Leon Uris because of his inaccuracies in some of the things he wrote about him, particularly in relation to religion in Ireland. Um, and she herself, of course, was a stickler for getting things right and for researching. Yes, indeed. And Declan Kybert mentions that in his appreciation uh, of, at her death uh, in 1994 in the Irish Times, that she was so scrupulous in her, in her historical research. And we might come back to that point in a minute. But I just want to uh, hone in on the, you know, the genre of historical fiction in the 1970s. Um, Hilary Mantle, in, a, in an article in The Guardian in 2017, stated, uh, entitled Why I Became a Historical Novelist, she says, I began writing fiction in the 1970s. In those days, historical fiction wasn't respectable or respected. It meant historical romance. If you read a brilliant novel like Robert Graves' I, Claudius, you didn't taint it with the genre label, you just thought of it as literature. So I was shy about naming what I was doing. All the same, I began. Now, there's a sense there, I think, that she encapsulates that uh, some of the issues around gender and genre uh, that come up, um, you know, and do you, th do you think that Eilish Dillon's legacy has been adversely affected by, you know, some of that tainting of historical fiction and branding yes, of it? I, yes, I, I think from the very beginning she was very conscious she was a female writer when at a time maybe it wasn't fashionable to be so in the, in the very early stages. And I think she carried that with her. Um, but it did become respectable more or less, as I said, in the 70s. But at the same time, there was an expectation of romance in there and she, she had to answer to that uh, very much. So in a way, it probably wasn't her forte and she was much more interested herself, I think, in the historical elements of the story. But there had to be the, the sort of um, triangle of love or whatever in, in the middle of it. Um, yeah, even at the time, some of the book covers, she was quite critical about the sort of what she called Harlequin style book covers, um, where she herself preferred Jack B. Yeats paintings on the cover to give it more gravitas and so on. Um, but, you know, she, she lost that battle for some of the international copies of, of the books that were out there. Um, but interesting times for her. That is so interesting. And uh, she did, she, I think she writes in, in 1973 uh, about her, her writing about women's thoughts and private feelings as the last reserve in her apprenticeship as a young writer. Um, that she, you know, she had to build up the, the muscle to do that, to tackle that. Yeah, I think she was reserved about doing it, but felt that it was something that was expected. Um, and she she tried to, to do that uh, to the best of her ability. But I think there was always that reserve there and, and the fear of criticism and all of that as well. John, if I could just come to you there. Uh, Inside Ireland is a remarkable yes. <laughs> entity, isn't it really? It's, Indeed. as you mentioned, it's kind of, a, there's a bit of travel writing, there's historiography, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a memoir as well. So it's kind of almost like its own genre in itself. Um, 
And while we do get that, that sense of a very you know, privileged voice uh, coming from elite, an elite middle class background through the centuries, I also found it quite moving because of that social conscience that, that mm -hmm. permeates through the book. The sense that, you know, yes, her family uh, were from, you know, the upper echelons of society. Uh, and yet also that, that there's that running alongside that there's a sense of ethics and, you know, looking out for, uh, for the, the, the dispossessed Catholics and trying to educate them and, <clears throat> and making sacrifices then and it comes right up to the 20th century. Um, so it's quite moving as well in, in places. Would you agree with that? Or? Yes, I think she's um, trying to locate herself and to give some sort of a genealogy for her own and perhaps her father's, even though it's the Plunkets uh, she uh, hone, hones in on uh, when, she, when she tries uh, to do that. And she looks back through the centuries, um, looking at the various uh, luminaries who bore the, uh, the Plunkett name in particular. Um, uh, there were, yeah, uh, the, uh, and I suppose uh, showing how the, the, by and large, they uh, supported the Catholic cause and also uh, had schools in their houses. But all, all, at the, all, all the time, it's clear she's... Um, um, su suggesting a kind of a, this um, uh, leadership role in Irish society, uh, I think. And I suppose uh, there was an interesting detail, I thought, uh, when she talks about the more recent, I think it was uh, 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 the, the, her great-grandparents' uh, generation, um, uh, building contractors, essentially. Uh, so. Um, uh, even there, she uh, tries to include some hint of uh, subversion, as it were. She talks how they uh, deliberately named their, um, uh, some of their developments yeah. uh, for uh, British nobles uh, who were somewhat uh, in, uh, in disgrace, as it were. So she cites uh, Lord Elgin, as in the marbles and so on, and Lord Raglan. Uh, as kind of acts of, 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 of some sort of mischief, at least. Um, um, uh, yeah, which uh, perhaps stretches uh, things a little bit, uh, perhaps, yeah. And that would, uh, that, that sits very well with, I suppose, something that Elaine Nicolanon said to me during the course of the book club. She said, we were taught history in the family as a counter narrative. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, so I just thought that was very interesting. She talked about attending the canonization of, of um, Blessed Plunkett, Oliver. Yes, yeah. Blessed Oliver, yes. and her family going to Rome and kind of upsetting the apple cart a bit with the with the powers that be and <laughs> at the time. So there was this se there's, there's this sense of, of history and and I suppose critical thinking. You know, standing back from the the, the, the powers that be in the government and and you know assessing the ruination yes. of, of the, the colonial. Um, project and what's happening and trying to have that social conscience. I think it is really yeah. interesting in the book. And I suppose it's kind of partly trying to make sense of what's happened in the span of our own life, essentially, which is the span of this uh, new uh, of this new state. It's kind of a generationality in the book and a genealogical yes. aspect. It's all a composite of all of these things, I suppose one, one could say. So I suppose just to just to uh, yeah. one of the things that's interesting as well, I suppose, is uh, I suppose uh, she does address the, uh, uh, the, the the troubles of uh, in, in the north in um, in that in inside Ireland, as she did uh, publicly on, on a number of occasions. Uh, so um, I suppose the perspective is about kind of a John Hume perspective, I would say, a kind of an SDLP. Uh, perspective on the uh, on on the reality of the 1970s and and uh, and early 80s when the when the, when the book appeared. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks very much, yeah. uh, Dr. John Cunningham, Dr. Anne Marie Heron, Dr. Jim Higgins. It's been a real pleasure discussing Eilish Dillon's life and legacy with you all. Thanks so much. Thank you.